This video gives some tricks for deciding whether a sequence converges. We say that a sequence a sub n converges if the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the terms a sub n exists as a finite number. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges. In other words, a sequence diverges if the limit is infinity or negative infinity or does not exist. More formally, we said the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l if for any small number epsilon there's a number capital N such that when the index little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, a sub n is within distance epsilon of L. Saying that a sub n is within distance epsilon of L is the same thing as saying that the absolute value of a sub n minus L is less than epsilon. Let me draw this as a picture. If we put n on the x-axis and a sub n on the y-axis, we can plot our terms a sub n like this. Here it looks like our a sub n's are settling at a particular value. I'll draw the value on the y-axis and call it L. We say that the limit of a sub n is equal to L because for any tiny number epsilon, here I've tried to draw a distance epsilon above L and a distance epsilon below L, we can trap our a sub n's within epsilon of L by requiring the index n to be big enough. For the epsilon I've chosen here, our a sub n's are trapped within epsilon of L when little n is bigger than or equal to 3. So there is that big number n, which is here like 2 or 3, such that when little n is bigger than that, the a sub n's are always trapped within epsilon of L. And if I'd chosen a tinier epsilon, I would just have to go a little bit farther out to make sure that my sequence was trapped within epsilon of n of L. This is the epsilon definition of a limit. Formally, we say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is infinity if for any big number, omega, there's a number capital N such that a sub n is bigger than capital N for little n bigger than or equal to capital N. In other words, no matter how big an omega I originally pick, my terms a sub n are eventually trapped above omega. Let me draw a picture for this one too. My terms here again are drawn in red, and now if I pick a certain height omega, eventually all my terms will be above omega. And if I pick a different, bigger value of omega, my terms will still eventually be bigger than omega. I might just need to go further out in my sequence. For this first value of omega, I would just need to pick a capital N of about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Once my little n's are all bigger than 6, my a sub n's are bigger than that omega. And for this bigger value of omega, I'd need to pick a value of capital N of about 9. Once my little n's are bigger than about 9, all my a sub n's would be bigger than this omega. There's a similar definition for the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equaling negative infinity. Now we just need to say that for any big negative number, omega, there's a number n such that a sub n is less than omega for little n bigger than or equal to capital N. Please take a moment and try to come up with an example of a sequence that converges, a sequence that diverges to infinity or negative infinity, and a sequence that's bounded but still diverges. One example of a convergent sequence is a sequence 1 over n.
this sequence converges to zero since the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n is zero. A divergent sequence is two to the n since the limit as n goes to infinity of two to the n is infinity. One example of a sequence that's bounded but still diverges is negative one to the n. This sequence alternates between negative one and one depending on whether n is odd or even. So it's bounded in between negative one and one, but it still diverges because the limit does not exist since the sequence doesn't settle at a single value. The rest of this video will give some techniques for proving that sequences converge. The first technique is to use standard calculus tricks for finding limits of functions. Even though a sequence is only defined on positive integers, sometimes it's possible to find a function defined on all positive real numbers that agrees with our sequence on the integers. In other words, the terms a sub n are equal to f of n for this function f. When this happens, then if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n also equals l. The red dots are converging to the same limit as the blue function. So a lot of times we can figure out if a sequence converges by replacing the terms a sub n with f of x for some appropriate function and then using L'Hopital's rule or other tricks from calculus one to show that the function's limit exists. Let's try that for the following example. When the indices are missing, as in this example, we'll assume that n starts at one and goes to infinity. In order to prove that this sequence converges, let's instead look at the function f of x equals ln one plus two e to the x over x, where x is a real number. Now let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. That's the limit as x goes to infinity of ln one plus two e to the x over x. And as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes to infinity. So one plus two times e to the x goes to infinity, which means ln of that goes to infinity. So the numerator is going to infinity as x goes to infinity, and so is the denominator. We have an infinity over an infinity indeterminate form. So we can apply L'Hopital's rule and take the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of the numerator is one over one plus two times e to the x times two times e to the x using the chain rule and the derivative of the denominator is just one. We can take derivatives here because we're thinking of x as a real number, not just an integer. Simplifying, we still have an infinity over infinity indeterminate form, so let's take the derivatives again. The derivative of the numerator is now two times e to the x, and the derivative of the denominator is also two times e to the x, so our limit here is one. Since our function converges to one, our sequence also converges to one. So this original sequence converges to one. Another technique for proving that sequences converge is to use the squeeze theorem and trap the sequence between two simpler sequences that converge to the same limit. In this example, since sine and cosine are both bounded in between one and negative one, we know that cosine of n plus sine of n can't be any bigger than two, certainly, or any smaller than negative two. If I divide all sides of this inequality by n to the two-thirds, we can see that the original sequence is bounded in between negative two over n to the two-thirds and two over n to the two-thirds. Notice that n to the two-thirds has to be positive, since as usual, we're assuming that n starts as one and goes to infinity. And so dividing by n to the two-thirds 
does not switch the inequality signs. Now it's easy to check that the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 2 over n to the 2 thirds is 0, since as n goes to infinity, n to the 2 thirds also goes to infinity. Similarly, the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over n to the 2 thirds is 0. Since these two limits are the same, we know by the squeeze theorem that the limit of our sequence in the middle has to exist at equal 0 also. It's a remarkable fact that I won't prove here that if a sub n is bounded and monotonic, then it has to converge. You might get some intuition for this fact by looking at a graph. If the a sub n's are monotonically increasing, for example, but are bounded, then there's no place for the a sub n's to go. And they can't oscillate up and down because they're monotonically increasing. So it makes intuitive sense that they have to settle on some limit. A fun example of this fact is a sequence that starts 0 0.1, 0 0.12, 0 0.123, 0 0.1234, and so on, where we just keep stringing together the counting numbers as our decimal. This sequence is certainly monotonically increasing, and it's bounded since every term of the sequence is greater than 0 and less than, say, 0.5. So we have a bounded monotonic sequence, and so this sequence has to converge. Now, what it actually converges to is a little mysterious, since it doesn't converge to some number we're already familiar with, like, like 0.6 or pi over 3 or something like that. But it does converge to some real number, and that real number is called Champin nouns constant. And it has some interesting properties, and of course it has a decimal expansion that's easy to, to come up with, since you get it just by stringing together the counting numbers. If you can recognize a sequence to be a geometric sequence, then it's pretty easy to decide whether it converges or diverges. Recall that a geometric sequence is a sequence of the form a times r to the n minus 1, where n runs from 1 to infinity, or sometimes it's written as a times r to the n, where n runs from 0 to infinity. Let's try to figure out for what values of r the sequence r to the n converges. It's not very important here whether n starts at 0 or starts at 1, since when we talk about convergence, we're talking about the behavior of the terms as n goes to infinity. So the first few terms really don't matter. If r is greater than 1, then the sequence r to the n is an increasing sequence. In fact, for the sequence r to the n, if we replace n with x and look at the function f of x equals r to the x, that's an exponential function. And if we're assuming r is greater than 1, the base for our exponential functions is, is greater than 1. So we know that the limit as x goes to infinity of r to the x is infinity, which means that our sequence r to the n also has to diverge to infinity. If instead r is equal to 1, then r to the n is just 1 to the n, which is just a sequence of 1's, so that converges to 1. If r is between 0 and 1, then r to the n is decreasing. This time, it's like the exponential function f of x equals r to the x with the base between 0 and 1. And so the limit of that exponential function as x goes to infinity is going to be equal 0. Therefore, the sequence also converges to zero.
course, if r equals exactly 0, then the sequence is just a sequence of zeros, so it also converges to 0. Next, let's look at the case when r is between negative 1 and 0. Now, the sequence of r to the n's are going to oscillate between positive and negative numbers that get smaller and smaller in magnitude as n goes to infinity. That's because we get from one number to the next by multiplying by r, which is a negative number of magnitude less than 1. So our limit as n goes to infinity of our a to the n's is going to be 0 again. Another way of thinking about this case is by thinking about the squeeze theorem. Since r to the n is always less than or equal to the absolute value of r to the n, which is and it's always greater than or equal to negative the absolute value of r to the n. Technically, r to the n is always exactly equal to the absolute value of r to the n when n is even, so that r to the n is positive, and it's always exactly equal to the negative of the absolute value of r to the n when n is odd, so that r to the n is, is, is negative. But in any case, the inequality still does technically hold, and so therefore, since by the squeeze theorem, the limit of the left terms is 0, and the limit of the right terms is 0, as we noted before, the limit of the middle term also has to be 0. So our sequence converges to 0. Now if r is equal to negative 1, then our sequence r to the n is just negative 1 to the n, which alternates between negative 1 and 1. And so that sequence diverges. Finally, if r is less than negative 1, then to get from one term to the next, we're multiplying by a negative number that has magnitude bigger than 1, and so our terms are going to oscillate between positive and negative numbers, but they're going to be going up in magnitude. And so the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n does not exist, and we see that our sequence diverges. If we look through all these cases, we see that the sequence r to the n converges to 0 when r is between negative 1 and 1. It converges to 1 when r is exactly equal to 1, and it diverges when r is bigger than 1 or less than negative 1. I'll write that summary below. In fact, almost the same thing is true when we look at the sequence a times r to the n, where a is any real number. The sequence a times r to the n converges to 0 when r is between negative 1 and 1. It converges to a when r is equal to 1. And it diverges when r is less than negative 1 or greater than 1. This follows because multiplying all the terms in the sequence by a just multiplies the limit by a. And 0 times a is 0, while 1 times a is a. So anytime you encounter a geometric sequence, that is a sequence that can be written in the form of a times r to the n, you can know that it converges if r is bigger than negative 1 and less than or equal to 1. This sequence here although it looks really complicated, it's really a geometric sequence in disguise. One way to see this is by simplifying the form of the terms. This is negative 1 to the t, e to the t times e to the minus 1 over 3 to the t times 3 squared. Now this is the same thing as negative e over 3 to the t times 1 over 3 squared times e. Now this is looking like the tail end of a geometric sequence where a is 1 over 3 squared times e and r, the common ratio, is minus e over 3.
I say the tail end because we have t starting at 3 instead of at 0. Now since e is less than 3, the magnitude of r is got to be smaller than 1. In other words, r is a negative number that's between negative 1 and 0, and therefore the tail end of this geometric sequence converges. It's kind of interesting to note that we could also rewrite this geometric sequence if we wanted to using an index n going from 0 to infinity. And one way to figure out how to do that, the r, the common ratio, stays the same as negative e over 3. But since this version starts at t equals 3, the first term here is really minus e over 3 cubed times 1 over 3 squared e. And that becomes our value of a. Notice that when n is 0 here, I get this value. And when t is 3 here, I get the same value for this sequence. So these sequences are equivalent. But in any case, for either sequence, the common ratio r is negative e over 3, and the sequence converges, therefore. The final trick that I want to mention for deciding whether sequences converge or diverge is limit laws. The usual limit laws about addition, subtraction, and so on hold for sequences as well as for functions. So for example, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is l and the limit of b sub n is m, then the limit of the sum a sub n plus b sub n is going to be equal to l plus m. And the limit of a sub n times b sub n is l times m. And the limit of c times a sub n, where c is some constant, is going to be c times l. Similar rules hold for subtraction and division. I want to emphasize that these limit holds hold under the condition that the limits of the component sequences exist as finite numbers. I can use these limit laws to decide if this sequence converges. Since the limit of the terms is equal to the difference of the limits, provided those limits exist. Now the first limit is 0, since the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator here. And the second limit is also 0. Since this is a geometric sequence with ratio of 4 fifths, and 4 fifths is between 0 and 1. Therefore, the limit of our original sequence must be 0. In this video, we saw several ways to prove that a sequence converges. We saw that we could use calculus techniques like L'Hopital's rule after replacing the sequence with its associated function defined on real numbers. We also saw that we could use the squeeze theorem. We noted that all sequences that are bounded and monotonic must converge. And we saw that geometric sequences always converge if r is bigger than negative 1 and less than or equal to 1. Finally, we saw that we can use limit laws to handle sums and products and other conglomerations of sequences.